Okay, good afternoon, everyone. All right, everybody's excited because we're almost, we're almost done with the day, right? My name is Gary Watkins. I have uh, traveled from Hong Kong to be here this afternoon with you to talk about a very dynamic topic. <clears throat> now, I have looked at the schedule, and I am well aware that I am the last thing uh, for the day before dinner, so I will try my best to keep this time as meaningful and as entertaining as possible. I'll give you my disclaimer right away that despite my title and despite the title of this presentation, I don't claim to be a strategic genius. I do, however, claim to be like everyone else in this room, a practitioner of strategic thinking. I think we all use strategic thinking at many times and in various ways. And we're often put into situations where we're challenged to go into our inner depths of our minds to come up with ways to get in and out of certain scenarios. I think that there are some patterns that can be observed and some habits that can be learned along the way. And that's pretty much what we're going to talk about today. Now, the intent of the presentation is not for me to conduct a death by PowerPoint. <laughs> so I only have about 17 slides, so you're free to count them as we go along. But we're going to talk about a few terms and some definitions to give us some context for the material. Then we're going to look at some real world examples of strategic thinking applied in the real world. And then the pearl of the presentation is going to be what I call the five obsessions of a strategic thinker. I hope you've brought your sense of humor because it seems whenever we talk about the project management life or the struggles of a project manager, things can sometimes turn out to be quite comical. So let's get started with, uh, with a little story. A long time ago in a galaxy not so far away, <laughs> this happened. So who is this handsome young man, you might ask? I'll be glad to tell you. This is me at the age of 13. I certainly had a lot more hair and a lot less weight, but nevertheless, this picture was taken at a, a good time in life. <clears throat> taken back in the good old days where personal computing was just starting to make itself into the, into the home. Now, while this is a, a picture of me in my computer, in my room, uh, I have to admit that it was not easy getting it there. You see, my parents didn't really care much for computers back then, and I'm not so sure much has changed uh, since then. But when I first introduced the idea of buying a personal computer for me to my parents, it didn't quite go over the way I had hoped. I quickly realized that convincing them to get me a computer was going to take some strategic thinking on my part. How was I going to convince them to buy something they didn't really care for? Spend all kinds of money they didn't feel that they wanted to spend. Like I said, it wasn't easy. But nevertheless, my campaign began. I started off with cutting out ads in the newspaper on special deals at the local PC store. And I would post them on the refrigerator for them to see every day. <laughs> Figured maybe I could appeal to their economic interests. I tried getting them to realize how useful a PC would be for them. Okay. Yeah, we call that customer shaping in the business world. But unfortunately, as time went on, my tactics were proving to be fruitless. And I became more desperate. So I tried something much more formal. I actually drafted a contract with my parents. <laughs> the contract came complete with terms and conditions even two-party signature lines. It included everything from, I hereby declare to do all of my chores and the dishes and keep my room clean to pretty much anything else they wanted to throw on there because I was pretty desperate. All that for my very first PC, complete with a wired keyboard weighing in at maybe three kilograms, a CRT monitor that was capable of displaying an amazing array of 16 colors, <laughs> and a nine-pin dot matrix printer that sounded like a roaring Boeing 747 taking off every time you turned it on. But at the end of the day, I got what I wanted. 
What's funny is that I think I may have enjoyed the pursuit of actually trying to get them to get me the computer than I actually enjoy the computer itself. The look on my face in this photo was that one of, okay, now what? <clears throat> I share this story not only to be nostalgic, but also to make a point. Though we tend to use the, word, the term strategic very loosely, we easily associate it with activity for high-level executives. We tend to think that strategy is for CEOs, vice presidents, and directors of large enterprises. But I'd like everyone to entertain the idea that strategic thinking can occur for any pursuit, personal or professional, at any level, executive or technical. Even young kids can utilize strategic thinking. Okay. So the term strategic has become a very loosely used word. <clears throat> it seems as though we use the term for effect. If you want to make something sound really important, just sprinkle the word strategic on there. Instead of having a management meeting, have a strategic management meeting. <laughs> Instead of having a planning meeting, we'll have a strategic planning meeting. But what does the term imply for most people? If we get into definitions, we'll quickly find words like strategic management, strategic planning, strategic alignment, all have different meanings and different uses. But today we're going to talk about the one key ingredient that goes into all of those other things. So how does one go about defining the phrase strategic thinking? Well, we should do what all other prodigies, subject matter experts, and scholars do. We should Google it. <laughs> if you type the words into Google search, strategic thinking, this will be the first thing that pops up. Strategic thinking is the process that defines the manner in which people think about, assess, view, and create the future for themselves and others. I like this definition. But I zoned in onto a few key words that really got my attention. And I thought the definition could be trimmed down by saying, Strategic thinking is the manner in which people create the future. Create the future. Did you know you could create the future? I mean, the definition almost implies that you can create the future just by using strategic thinking. But it makes me beg the question, if you could create the future, how would you want it to look? I mean, if you had a magic lamp, you gave it a rub, and a genie came out, I imagine that you would take advantage of the opportunity and create a pretty favorable future for yourself. But unfortunately, I don't think any of us in this room have a magic lamp, so we'll have to resort to strategic thinking to make our dreams come true. So for the sake of this discussion, I'll submit to you a new definition for this term. Strategic thinking is the art of getting what you want. Think of some of the most successful people that you know. They seem to be pretty successful at getting what they want, particularly when other people can't. When these types of people set out to do something, they actually get it done. I think whenever we set out to do something meaningful, we begin with the basic information of the five W's. If you want to start a business, it's certainly important to know who you're going to start the business with, what are you going to offer, when is the best time to launch, where do you plan on working out of, and why is starting the business a good idea. But in the popularity of the five W's, there seems to be one more question that insists on being asked over and over and over again, and it's how. For example, how are you going to get the people on your team? How are you going to express your brand? How are you going to compete in the marketplace? 
Asking how really gets to the core root of your strategy. The same way a project schedule has a critical path and activities that carry a project to completion, a strategy is a set of critical directions that guide us to some sort of end state. The philosophy here is that not just any method will do to get us to where we want to go. So there has to be a differentiating approach. I think a lot of companies value the strategy behind the how because we protect it with all, legal, all different types of legal measures, with non-disclosure agreements, proprietary agreements. We even have gateway protection and encryption to, to secure all the documents and data that might give away how our company plans on competing in the marketplace. Let's take a look at a few different playing fields for strategies. In the business playing field, we're always looking for ways to gain greater market share and outdo the competition. Cost savings and efficiency improvements are ways that we gain competitive edge. How about the military? Generals are all often seeking leverage through resources and technology in an effort to gain higher ground over their enemies. Intelligence gathering is one of the key plays that militaries use to create leverage. Sports. Sports is another field that you can look at for strategies. Some sports teams actually conduct research and watch videos of their next opponent's game or the history of their games to develop their own strategy on how to play, how to play the next team. And speaking of games, the purpose of card games, board games, and video games are to exercise the mind. They force you to navigate through a challenge using only what you have available to you to make the most effective decisions that you can. The family life is no exception. How do you plan on raising your children? How do you plan on becoming financially secure, finding happiness together? Here's a fun one. Even those who work in the medical field are always looking for ways to resolve problems, either proactively or reactively, trying to prevent negative outcomes for their patients. When you see a doctor, you're basically waiting for the doctor to come back with a strategy on how to reduce the threat. I talk about these different playing fields to broaden the topic to more than just corporate executives, but to suggest the possibility that we all are practitioners of strategic thinking in one measure or another. To get us to realize that strategic thinking is not something that's far-fetched and we actually use it on a frequent basis. Now, how, an ef how effective a strategy is, is often measured by how great the challenge is. And challenges tend to show themselves in one of two different forms. The first form is the one that we like. This is the invited challenge. These are the things that are not necessarily critical for survival, but they're targets to achieve for the sake of our maturity or our growth. They're basically self-imposed goals and objectives. For example, let's take a look at one particular company, one of my favorites, a company called SpaceX. SpaceX set out to do something, some, something that has never been done before, a very complicated task of launching a rocket into the atmosphere, and after it's been depleted, land it vertically on a barge in the ocean. You can only imagine how difficult that rocket science is. Their interests were very practical though. Rather than trying to rebuild a broken rocket every time it crashed and burned in the ocean or was submerged underneath a saltwater environment and try to rebuild it all the way through, why not just try to land it and reuse the rocket? Makes practical sense. We do that with airplanes. We don't certainly land an airplane and then crash it into something, let it burn up, and then try to rebuild it for the next flight. We actually reuse it. So SpaceX had to try a few times before they were successful at this task, but the third time was a charm. And to their credit, they have had a successful landing ever since. So challenges do tend to show their face in the form of something exciting, something we want, something we invite, self-imposed. 
And these can actually be a lot of fun. But challenges also show their faces in not so friendly forms. The uninvited challenge. Unfortunately, we experience these way too often, which means it's becoming more relevant to learn how to operate when these scenarios are, are the case. So an uninvited challenge is something that is not self-imposed, not purposefully anyway. It's something more of a problem that you have to navigate through to find a strategic solution. An example of this is U.S. Airways flight <clears throat> in 2009 that landed in the Hudson River outside of New York City. The pilot and his 150 passengers departed New York en route to Seattle, and upon takeoff, the airplane ran into a flock of Canadian geese that were sucked into the engine, completely disabling them. So here, the now famous Captain Sully stood at 2,800 feet with 150 passengers in one of the most dense airspaces in one of the most dense cities in the world. This is certainly uninvited challenge. He didn't ask for this. Now, if you're familiar with the story, Captain Sully quick, quickly took the controls from the co-pilot and safely guided the aircraft into the Hudson River. Now, that's an extremely short version of that story, but there were plenty of times that that story could have gone worse because there was plenty of times that he could have made the wrong decision. Air traffic control tried to invite him back to the, to the uh, airport that he took off from, but he decided not to because he knew that he wasn't going to make it. At the end of the day, when you're faced with an invited challenge or an uninvited challenge, the purpose of strategic thinking is to achieve the results that you want. Many times in the workplace, we can be in such a rush to get work done that we forget what it is we actually want to deliver at the end. We forego the strategic thinking process and unfortunately it ends up showing in our product. It's not difficult to identify when strategic thinking has been foregone. These results kind of stand out. So for the sake of lessons learned and maybe even a little entertainment, let's take a look at some strategic thinking blunders times when maybe a little bit more thought could have gone into the product before delivery. These are not made up, by the way. These are, these are, these, this actually really, these things actually really happened. Let's start with a company that you, that you may have heard of called Urban Outfitters. They once tried to develop a new and edgy clothing line, but ended up delivering, up, delivering a product that strongly resembled a Holocaust prison inmate uniform, <laughs> complete with stripes and upside down triangle insignia. Not very tasteful, I imagine, to be seen on the streets or at a restaurant <clears throat> dressed like this. And you almost have to wonder how this one got through. Here's another one, Bloomingdale's. And if you can't read the header up top, it says, Spike your best friend's eggnog when they're not looking. Really? That's a little suggestive, isn't it? I mean, is Bloomingdale's cultivating a culture of date rape? Not too much strategic value in this ad. Unfortunately, the American pale lager company by the name of Budweiser didn't do any better. They just came right out on the can of beer and said, Perfect for removing no from your vocabulary for the night. Kind of scary. <laughs> well, here's a lighthearted one. Looks like someone was on, uh, on YouTube and was watching a video of a sinking cruise ship when an ad came up offering 75% off last minute daily deals on vacationstogo.com. <laughs> Now we all make mistakes, and then what's important is that we learn from our mistakes. After all, it's much easier to post pictures up of other people's mistakes rather than our own. But I share these examples to get us to wonder what kinds of things we should be considering when we set out to do something, and the implications of taking the fast track around strategic thinking opportunities. 
Now, the product of strategic thinking, of course, is to have an effective strategy. And maybe you already have one. There's a quote by a gentleman by the name of Steve Shelton on the topic. And it goes, there's two secrets to success. Number one, never reveal everything that you know. <laughs> but yes, there are people out there, and maybe there are some people in this room that have a winning strategy already working for them. We have people in this room that have found a way to deliver on time every time, below budget and high quality. My advice is to seek those people out and make them your mentor. While they're not likely to reveal their secrets, they may be able to help you find your own. Then there are times when you simply have to select a winning strategy out of a pool of options. Maybe the only real challenge there is committing to the strategy. Maybe you're preparing a proposal and a bid for a customer that has already outlined the requirements for what, how they're going to make their selection. And you simply have to comply and configure your bid to suit the requirements. This certainly is a good position to be in. But then there are times when, let's face it, you have no idea how you're going to make things happen. It's kind of like fishing. You feel like you're out there just sitting and waiting for the great ideas to bite so you can reel them in before they get away. This is the greatest exercise for the strategic thinker. I mean, in the perfect man project management world, we would have been assigned to a project at the very beginning of the project. We would have 100% capable, engaged team members. We would have been fully funded with adequate management reserve. Your risk register would be empty, and your meetings would be two minutes long. But instead, the real, world, the real world image is not so gentle. Instead, we're more likely to inherit a project that's already behind schedule, and it hasn't even started. Our resources are confused and frustrated, and are 50% of the planned manpower for the project. Our funding is at risk, and there's been five management reserves taken off the top before the funding has gotten to you. Your risk register is loaded, and your two-minute meetings are now turning into hourly working groups. Well, that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon, the type of thinking that's required when you have to build an idea from the ground up, when you're challenged to make something successful that you have never made successful before. In my observation and study of leadership, strategic thinking is not for the faint of heart. It's reserved for those who really, really want to win, who really want to create a future for themselves, who really want to achieve a specific target result. It does take us kind of exhaustive energy to figure out how to get what you want. These kinds of people that are successful tend to have an obsessive take on the topic. Like an engine, their brains are going into a cycle over and over and over and thinking, like a Monte Carlo to figure out how to get what it is that they want. So here it is. Here's what I believe to be the cycle that increases the chances of achieving desired results. Again, this is not something I think you can do once. It's something that needs to be done over and over and repeatedly. And depending on the complexity of the challenge at hand, you may not be satisfied until you know the answer to all these different elements. I think we can all agree that decisions are best made when they have taken into consideration all the available information. It's critical to know a few things before you move forward on something you set out to do. So before we touch on these five items, let's set out to do something. Using your imagination, or maybe you have a real life event, I'd like you to think about a challenge unique to you. Whether you're a project manager, a program manager, or a portfolio manager, you could be in the medical industry, you could be in IT, 
or you could work in aerospace. <clears throat> you could be in the corporate world, self-employed, or work for a nonprofit organization. Whatever it may be, I'd like you to get into a frame of mind where you're faced with an invited or uninvited challenge. A challenge that you feel is worthy of strategic thinking. As we go through these five obsessions, apply these considerations to your scenario and see if this works for you. The first one, know your end state. What does that mean? Well, it can be as simple or as abstract as you want it to be. If it can be anything as simple as, I want the next new iPhone. And the end state there is reached when you get the next new iPhone. Or it can be complex, as I want to be the only project manager in the world who has never been behind schedule. <laughs> the end state there was, would be when you retire and you have worked your entire career never having a project behind schedule. Hard to keep a face, straight face on that dream, but nevertheless, it's okay to dream big. Knowing your end state is really limited only to your imagination and, and defining what it is that you want but you have to define it. Like a project scope statement helps you decide what is and is not included in your project. Knowing your end state helps you to know which efforts are and are not contributing to your end state. It also helps you know when you arrived and when you're done. A good practice there is to have a two minute speech or, or less, an elevator speech on what your end state is. Make it something comprehensive and that's easy to recite and remember. Not to be used so much as advertising to others, but as a reminder to yourself. As you go through this obsessive cycle of trying to find a strategy, it's easy to get distracted, so it's good to have it written down and defined. The second link in the chain is know your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. In the military, we call this something similar to situational awareness. It's knowing the relationship between you and your surroundings. This link is very much about honesty, trust, and insight. It's the effort of recognizing all the elements that could influence the outcome of a competition. The third link is knowing your options. This is about the work that needs to be done when everyone else thinks the work is done. So many times we get wrapped up in doing things the way that we've always done them, only because it's the way that it's always been done. We accidentally bypass the need to ask questions or give a more critical review of what it is that we're actually trying to do. Knowing your options is about knowing that there's more than one way to accomplish something, including the things you may have accomplished before. Options also can be game changers. And when it comes to strategic thinking, one is always on the search and on the hunt for game changers. Number four, know your storyboard. This link is about integration, bringing all the characters, the settings, the plots together to form a graceful flow of events that's easy to understand and easy to appreciate. A storyboard shows consideration for all things considered. It shows the how that we talked about earlier. How we see things playing out, how things could change, how we plan on responding. It's the intellectual meeting point between the writer and the reader, the competitor and the competition, the project and the project environment. Lastly, Know when it's time to update. Unfortunately, most strategies come with an expiration date. The world is just evolving and moving too quickly for any static approaches to survive for very long. Knowing when to update is about knowing when to turn the thinking engine back on and making this process part of life again. Sometimes the right thing to do is to change your end state. Sometimes it's about deciding to target new strengths. Maybe it's time to re-inventory your options or revise how you think you see things playing out in the future. Overall, what I submit to you this afternoon is the linking in strategic thinking. Five different things that you have to know 
to formulate an effective strategy. Strategy often gets overlooked in project management because a lot of people see project management more of a, as a tactical profession. But like I mentioned earlier, I believe that strategy can be used for big or small challenges. All you need is a desired result that you're trying to achieve. So let's take a look at these links as they apply to project management arena and see what we can get. So how can we integrate strategic thinking into project management. Link number one, know your end state. When we think of the value of project management in the workplace, one of the first things that come to mind is the state of deliverables. If you haven't imagined the state of your deliverables, then you're probably not using project management. The PMBOK is constantly trying to get us into the discipline of planning, which requires an even stronger discipline of defining things up front. So if I ask you what is the end state of your deliverables, you may respond with a description of the features and functionalities of the product, which is fair and accurate report. But maybe there's some more strategic value in, pro in project management than just knowing the end state of your deliverables. For example, how about the end state of your company? I don't mean this in a, in a terminal sense, but what's at the most senior level of your organization what are they trying to do? How are they trying to steer the company? Some organizations come out with an annual statement of their goals and objectives for the year. The mission is unchanged, but the emphasis of the overall company and what they're trying to improve may have. Many times we get caught up working in our own work silos that we seldom have the time to step back and see what it is our project actually contributes to. I used to lead an aviation maintenance organization in the United States, and whenever I had a chance, I would take the administrative folks and the guys who were working in supply, I would take them out onto the aviation ramp to do what? To look at airplanes. They would get so stuck in their offices day to day that they would forget what it was they were actually contributing to, what their end product was. They would see an airplane take off and say, hey, that recognized that tail number, that tail number was the parts that I got for in, in the beginning of the week, and there, there, there she goes, you know? Guys who fix components in the back, radios, they would see the tail number and say, hey, that, that pilot right now is flying with the radio that I fixed last week. Linking the end state of what your company is trying to do with what your project is trying to do can place a greater value on team effort and reward. And speaking of teams, what would you say if someone asked you at the beginning of your project, what's the end state of your team gonna be when this is all over? Is the end state simply, well, they'll be done with their work? Or is there greater value that can be gained by targeting growth, experience, and do I dare say have a little fun with your team members? I mean, people are people. We all wake up in the morning, we say goodbye to our families, we do our best, we come home, we look forward to the weekend. Projects can offer great opportunity for new project management practices, great opportunities to establish new subcultures within the team. There are great opportunities to exercise individual talents outside of what someone was hired to do. Having an understanding of what your project can offer your team can create strategic value in your pursuit. And while we're talking about members, don't forget about yourself. You're a member. Outside of the customer, the company, and your team, consider the end state of your career. Your projects inherently become a bedrock in the talking points of your career. Knowing the target end state allows you to engage your projects more strategically. Maybe you want to take on that project that's failing because it could be, could be good to your career in showing people that you're not afraid of crisis management and you're actually good at it. Maybe you wanna take on that hopeful project that has all that growth potential so you can show people that you can exploit growth opportunities and you have a great network. Either way, knowing the end state of your career puts definition behind who you are as an artisan in your own craft. There's a scene from a great story called Alice in Wonderland where she's lost 
And she asks the new friend, which way should I go? And he asks her, well, where is it that you want to go? And her response was, well, it doesn't really matter as long as I get somewhere. And he says, well, then it doesn't matter which way you go. Any way will get you there. So I'll ask the rhetorical question today. Where do you want to go? What is your target end state of your deliverables, of the company that you work for, the employees that are part of your team, and your personal career? If you have that down, you will be able to find greater strategic harmony on the road to your goals and objectives. The next link in the chain, number two, know your SWOT. This is the understanding of the relationship between you and your surroundings. It takes a lot of observation and reflection to get a clear picture, but when you do, you're able to navigate around your projects with greater accuracy and control, guiding you strategically to that end state. The SWOT is sometimes closely associated with sales and marketing activity because they use it to evaluate how successful a product or service is going to be in the marketplace. But it also can be used to calculate, calculate things like how effective a project, management, project manager is going to be on his or her project. For example, if you're going to use the SWOT on yourself, you may find that your strength as a PM is that you're really good at being organized but your weakness is understanding the technical aspects of a project. It's important to be honest and acknowledge those weaknesses so you can respond to the risky position that they may put you in. Likewise, if you know your strength is organizing, then your team should have efficient access to information. I once worked with a guy who was so organized that even when he didn't show up to work, his team members would come to his desk carefully, go to his shelf, pull out all of his documents, open up his plan, his schedule, his financial reports, get answers to all their questions, and then again, carefully, putting it back on a shelf as to not disturb the system. This kind of strength helps him to avoid any risks to his projects and to his team. A little identification of your strengths and your weaknesses can bring forth a lot of cognizance for strategic consideration. What about the things outside of your control, the external opportunities and threats? We're all vulnerable to changes outside of our control. But just because things are outside of our control doesn't mean that we can't use the information to set up a roadmap to success. Maybe the opportunity for you in one of your projects is a customer has given an incentive for high performance while a threat could be that an outside legislation could change how you get parts for a cheap price. External factors can be very much like the weather. In the project management world, it could be raining change orders one day, and then the next day, shining, sunshining resources. You never really know. That's kind of what makes our jobs exciting. But those who can forecast the weather are the ones that can best prepare for it. It's important to stay plugged in and up to date. Sometimes one of the riskiest things you can do as a project manager when things are going well is to relax. <laughs> Use the time to stay up to date on the things that are outside of your control and keep an eye out for indicators of sparks before the fire. The point here is that if you set out to do something and you really want to achieve a particular end state, strategic thinking will guide you back to the SWOT every time. <coughs> Link number three, we're halfway there. Link number three, know your options. There's a quote from Sherlock Holmes in the movie where he says, I'm Sherlock Holmes. It's my business to know what other people don't know. So what is it that other people don't know? Or more importantly, why don't they know? I suspect most people don't know things because they don't put forth the energy to find out what all the possibilities are. I find that most habits, particularly those in the workplace, are passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. 
This means that we get, up, we get caught up in doing things the way that we've always done because that's the way we've always done them. And we forget the value in actually modernizing. So what does knowing all of your options mean? It means investigating. It means evaluating, asking questions. Knowing your options takes a lot of courage because in a world where we're very insecure about our profession, our education, and our experience, we don't like to be seen as someone who asks a lot of questions. But there are some organizations, and I like to pick on Amazon, who have an open door policy where all employees are able to submit questions and ideas, which loosens the stigma associated with asking questions. Why do they do this? So they can get a, a, a handle on what all the options are available to them, that all options can be considered. It allows teams to innovate, adding greater value to the cause, and increasing the fidelity of a winning strategy. My big rhetorical question to everyone here today is, do you really know all of your options? Have you considered the make or buy? Is there a chance to innovate? What are some of the things you could trade off? Here's a scary one. Could you ask for help? We often forget though that asking for help is an option. And what about prioritizing? Saying yes to something because you've already said no to other things or vice versa, saying no to something because you've already said yes to something else. Whether you're handling a project, trying to, co trying to win a competitive bid, or trying to reach better margins in your portfolio, what is the selection of decisions that you have available to choose from? I can tell you that from my observation, it can be tempting to resort to conventional, popular, or easy options. But those options are going to be there anyway. They've always been there. So if you want your strategy to have differentiating value, then you have to find ways to make your options different. Link number four, know your storyboard. What does that mean, know your storyboard? Well, let's start from the beginning of the links. After you define your end state, you gain situa situational awareness by identifying your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You lay out all of your options and you investigate what it is that you can select from as far as decisions are concerned. It's time to put all that together and package it into a story something comprehensive and digestible. Now, strategy isn't always perfect, but it should be reasonable, and above all things, believable. The storyboard has to tell how your strategy is set up to operate, how it will work effectively, and how it will achieve that end state. It needs to be framed with information collected and considered about the past, the present, and the future. The past, events setting the tone for the current state, which gives us the opportunity to create the future. In comparison, a project schedule articulates tasks assembled to deliver an overall effort, but a storyboard includes a spectrum of calculated assumptions, predictions, and recommended decisions along the way. The strategic storyboard needs to address decision points. At what points will, will there be times that the current strategy is working? And when it's not, may need an update. And subsequently, what are those impacts? What happens after something changes? Are we ready for those changes? Those events that along the way that could change the complexity of the stakes at hand. When those types of things happen, then what? What's the next move that aligns us all back into the overall end state that we're trying to achieve? If you haven't considered your past, your present, and your future, if you haven't considered the, the decision points, the impacts or responses to particular events, then your plan will have very little strategic value. Knowing how you plan to exploit opportunities and reduce risk effectively is an obsessive thought of a strategic thinker. It's not just a one-time consideration, but a constant running state of mind. And it should be, and here's why. 
Link number five, know when it's time to update. In a world of opportunity, globalism, innovation, strategies unfortunately have expiration dates. Competition is so high that it seems as though game changers are being introduced into industries faster than we can adjust to. Any strategy that appears to be working will always be at risk of expiring. So we need to know when it's time to update and only update when it's the right time. So what kind of questions should we be asking? Let's start off with, well, is your strategy currently working? If you're getting performance out of your project, then maybe it's not the best time to make changes. But if the effects of your hard work appear to be dying off, it may be an indicator that you need to make some changes. External factors like laws or legislation can have an impact on your decision to update. In cases like this, external factors sometimes can often make the decision for you. You don't really have much of a choice. What about a game changer? We see this kind of activity happening all the time in technology. I almost get offended sometimes when I hear people use the term phone and iPhone interchangeably. I'm an Android guy. <laughs> but the iPhone has been a game changer, that people use it interchangeably. Same thing with GoPro cameras. No matter where you bought that product from or what's, what's written on the label, as long as it's small and it comes in a plastic case, everyone you know is going to call it a GoPro. Technology is very prideful in a sense. But in project management, there are game changers. I remember the first time I ever used a risk management Rubik's Cube color chart. The organization that I worked for at the time was dazzled by it. It brought up the early discussion of incorporating risk management as an overall practice for the company. Yes, believe it or not, large enterprises still don't use traditional risk management practices. But either way, it was a game changer and really opened the door for a lot of other project management tools for the company. How about growth? Growth can play a key role in determining when it's a good time to update your strategy. Maybe you've developed some new capabilities and some new capacities and your new end state should reflect those new abilities. Or maybe the opposite is true and there haven't made, been any changes since the launch of your company and it's just simply outdated. But nevertheless, timing plays a critical role in any change and updating your strategy in this case is no different. Okay, so we're approaching the end of the session and so you're welcome to start generating any questions or comments if we still have time. <clears throat> Allow me to go over a couple of uh, important points that we kind of talked about. First, strategic thinking is the art of getting what you want. It's laying out an end state and then solving the equation of the events it takes to get there. Whether you're seeking to invite a challenge or you're seeking to navigate beyond an uninvited challenge, strategic thinking will be your best shot at achieving desired results. So the question of the day is, What is it that you want? What is it that you're seeking? Whether it be from a healthy lifestyle to a successful project management career, whatever your goal may be, I believe with a strongly defined end state, a cognizant understanding of your SWOT, the searching and sifting of, through of all of the options that are available to you, and assembling that entire vision into how you see things playing out, I believe that these things are likely to have a better chance at giving you desired results. And don't forget that strategies are short-lived and have expiration dates. It's important to understand a criteria that signifies when your strategy has been taken below its effective position and when it needs updating. And as I mentioned earlier, strategic thinking is not for the faint of heart. It's obsessive and sometime, sometimes exhaustive mental work, but it's the one skill that has proven to deliver results on purpose where other people have delivered by accident. Thank you for your time. I hope this has been stimulating and entertaining for everyone here, and I'll open up the floor for any comments or questions. Thank you very much.
Not too bad on time. Right on time. If there's no questions, I, I, can, I can hear stomachs growling, so. Any questions? No? Okay, then we would like to thank Mr. Gary um, for his informative talk. I'd like to invite um, Mr. Surya, our chair of the symposium for this year, to give away a token of appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs>